Book One, Chapter One, Part Two of Armadale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Winterroud. Armadale by Wilkie Collins. Chapter One, Part Two. He found Mrs. Armadale suffering under violent, nervous agitation, caused entirely by a recent interview with her son. Allan had been sitting with her all the morning, and had talked of nothing but his new friend. The man with the horrible name, as poor Mrs. Armadale described him, had questioned Allan, in a singularly inquisitive manner, on the subject of himself and his family, but had kept his own personal history entirely in the dark. At some former period of his life he had been accustomed to the sea and to sailing. Allan had unfortunately found this out, and a bond of union between them was formed on the spot. With a merciless distrust of the stranger, simply because he was a stranger, which appeared rather unreasonable to Mr. Brock, Mrs. Armadale besought the rector to go to the inn without a moment's loss of time, and never to rest until he had made the man give a proper account of himself. "'Find out everything about his father and mother,' she said, in her vehement female way. "'Make sure before you leave him that he is not a vagabond roaming the country under an assumed name.' "'My dear lady,' remonstrated the rector, obediently taking his hat, "'whatever else we may doubt, I really think we may feel sure about the man's name. It is so remarkably ugly that it must be genuine.' No sane human being would assume such a name as Ozias Midwinter. You may be quite right, and I may be quite wrong, but pray go and see him, persisted Mrs. Armadale. Go, and don't spare him, Mr. Brock. How do we know that this illness of his may not have been put on for a purpose? It was useless to reason with her. The whole college of physicians might have certified to the man's illness, and in her present frame of mind, Mrs. Armadale would have disbelieved the college, one and all, from the president downward. Mr. Brock took the wise way out of the difficulty. He said no more, and he set off for the inn immediately. Ozias Midwinter, recovering from brain fever, was a startling object to contemplate on a first view of him. His shaven head, tied up in an old yellow silk handkerchief, his tawny haggard cheeks, his bright brown eyes, preternaturally large and wild, his rough black beard, his long, supple, sinewy fingers, wasted by suffering till they looked like claws, all tended to discompose the rector at the outset of the interview. When the first feeling of surprise had worn off, the impression that followed it was not an agreeable one. Mr. Brock could not conceal from himself that the stranger's manner was against him. The general opinion had settled that, if a man is honest, he is bound to assert it by looking straight at his fellow creatures when he speaks to them. If this man was honest, his eyes showed a singular perversity in looking away and denying it. Possibly they were affected in some degree by a nervous restlessness in his organization, which appeared to pervade every fiber in his lean, lithe body. The rector's healthy Anglo-Saxon flesh crept responsively at every casual movement of the usher's supple brown fingers, and every passing distortion of the usher's haggard yellow face. God forgive me, thought Mr. Brock, with his mind running on Allan and Allan's mother. I wish I could see my way to turning Ozias Midwinter adrift in the world again. The conversation which ensued between the two was a very guarded one. Mr. Brock felt his way gently, and found himself, try where he might, always kept politely, more or less, in the dark. From first to last, the man's real character shrank back with a savage shyness from the rector's touch. He started by an assertion which it was impossible to look at him and believe. He declared that he was only twenty years of age. All he could be persuaded to say on the subject of the school was that the bare recollection of it was horrible to him. He had only filled the usher's situation for ten days, when the first appearance of his illness caused his dismissal. How he had reached the field in which he had been found was more than he could say. He remembered traveling a long distance by railway, with a purpose, if he had a purpose, 
which it was now impossible to recall, and then wandering coastward on foot all through the day, or all through the night, he was not sure which. The sea kept running in his mind when his mind began to give way. He had been employed on the sea as a lad. He had left it, and had filled a situation at a bookseller's in a country town. He had left the bookseller's, and had tried the school. Now the school had turned him out, he must try something else. It mattered little what he tried. Failure, for which nobody was ever to blame but himself, was sure to be the end of it sooner or later. Friends to assist him he had none to apply to, and as for relations, he wished to be excused from speaking of them. For all he knew they might be dead, and for all they knew he might be dead. That was a melancholy acknowledgment to make at his time of life, there was no denying it. It might tell against him in the opinion of others, and it did tell against him, no doubt, in the opinion of the gentleman who was talking to him at that moment. These strange answers were given in a tone and manner far removed from bitterness on the one side, or from indifference on the other. Ozias Midwinter, at twenty, spoke of his life as Ozias Midwinter, at seventy, might have spoken with a long weariness of years on him, which he had learned to bear patiently. Two circumstances pleaded strongly against the distrust with which, in sheer perplexity of mind, Mr. Brock blindly regarded him. He had written to a savings bank in a distant part of England, had drawn his money, and had paid the doctor and the landlord. A man of vulgar mind, after acting in this manner, would have treated his obligations lightly when he had settled his bills. Ozias Midwinter spoke of his obligations, and especially of his obligation to Allan, with a fervor of thankfulness which it was not surprising only, but absolutely painful to witness. He showed a horrible sincerity of astonishment at having been treated with common Christian kindness in a Christian land. He spoke of Allan's having become answerable for all the expenses of sheltering, nursing, and curing him, with a savage rapture of gratitude and surprise, which burst out of him like a flash of lightning. "'So help me God!' cried the castaway usher. "'I never met with the like of him. I never heard of the like of him before.' In the next instant, the one glimpse of light which the man had let in on his own passionate nature was quenched again in darkness. His wandering eyes, returning to their old trick, looked uneasily away from Mr. Brock, and his voice dropped back once more into its unnatural steadiness and quietness of tone. "'I beg your pardon, sir,' he said. "'I have been used to be hunted and cheated and starved. Everything else comes strange to me.' Half attracted by the man, half repelled by him, Mr. Brock, on rising to take leave, impulsively offered his hand, and then, with a sudden misgiving, confusedly drew it back again. "'You meant that kindly, sir,' said Ozias Midwinter, with his own hands crossed resolutely behind him. "'I don't complain of your thinking better of it. A man who can't give a proper account of himself is not a man for a gentleman in your position to take by the hand.' Mr. Brock left the inn thoroughly puzzled. Before returning to Mrs. Armadale, he sent for her son. The chances were that the guard had been off the stranger's tongue when he spoke to Allan, and with Allan's frankness there was no fear of his concealing anything that had passed between them from the rector's knowledge. Here again Mr. Brock's diplomacy achieved no useful results. Once started on the subject of Ozias Midwinter, Allan rattled on about his new friend in his usual easy, light-hearted way. But he had really nothing of importance to tell, for nothing of importance had been revealed to him. They had talked about boat-building and sailing by the hour together, and Alan had got some valuable hints. They had discussed, with diagrams to assist them, and with more valuable hints for Alan, the serious impending question of the launch of the yacht. On other occasions they had diverged to other subjects, to more of them than Alan could remember on the spur of the moment. Had Midwinter said nothing about his relations in the flow of all this friendly talk? Nothing, except that they had not behaved well to him, hang his relations. Was he at all sensitive on the subject of his own odd name? Not the least in the world. He had set the example, like a sensible fellow, of laughing at it himself. Mr. Brock still persisted. He inquired next what Alan had seen in the stranger 
to take such a fancy to. Allan had seen in him what he didn't see in people in general. He wasn't like all the other fellows in the neighborhood. All the other fellows were cut out on the same pattern. Every man of them was equally healthy, muscular, loud, hard-hearted, clean-skinned, and rough. Every man of them drank the same draughts of beer, smoked the same short pipes all day long, rode the best horse, shot over the best dog, and put the best bottle of wine in England on his table at night. Every man of them sponged himself every morning in the same sort of tub of cold water, and bragged about it in frosty weather in the same sort of way. Every man of them thought getting into debt a capital joke, and betting on horse races one of the most meritorious actions that a human being can perform. They were, no doubt, excellent fellows in their way, but the worst of them was, they were all exactly alike. It was a perfect godsend to meet with a man like Midwinter, a man who was not cut out on the regular local pattern, and whose way in the world had the one great merit, in those parts, of being a way of his own. Leaving all remonstrances for a fitter opportunity, the rector went back to Mrs. Armadale. He could not disguise from himself that Allan's mother was the person really answerable for Allan's present indiscretion. If the lad had seen a little less of the small gentry in the neighborhood, and a little more of the great outside world at home and abroad, the pleasure of cultivating Ozias Midwinter's society might have had fewer attractions for him. Conscious of the unsatisfactory result of his visit to the inn, Mr. Brock felt some anxiety about the reception of his report when he found himself once more in Mrs. Armadale's presence. His forebodings were soon realized. Try as he might to make the best of it, Mrs. Armadale seized on the one suspicious fact of the usher's silence about himself as justifying the strongest measures that could be taken to separate him from her son. If the rector refused to interfere, she declared her intention of writing to Ozias Midwinter with her own hand. Remonstrance irritated her to such a pitch that she astounded Mr. Brock by reverting to the forbidden subject of five years since, and referring him to the conversation which had passed between them when the advertisement had been discovered in the newspaper. She passionately declared that the vagabond Armadale of that advertisement, and the vagabond Midwinter at the village inn, might, for all she knew to the contrary, be one and the same. Foreboding a serious disagreement between the mother and son if the mother interfered, Mr. Brock undertook to see Midwinter again, and to tell him plainly that he must give a proper account of himself, or that his intimacy with Allan must cease. The two concessions which he exacted from Mrs. Armadale in return were that she should wait patiently until the doctor reported the man fit to travel, and that she should be careful in the interval not to mention the matter in any way to her son. In a week's time, Midwinter was able to drive out, with Allan for his coachman, in the pony chase belonging to the inn, and in ten days the doctor privately reported him as fit to travel. Toward the close of that tenth day, Mr. Brock met Allan and his new friend enjoying the last gleams of wintry sunshine in one of the inland lanes. He waited until the two had separated, and then followed the usher on his way back to the inn. The rector's resolution to speak pitilessly to the purpose was in some danger of failing him as he drew nearer and nearer to the friendless man, and saw how feebly he still walked how loosely his worn coat hung about him, and how heavily he leaned on his cheap, clumsy stick. Humanely reluctant to say the decisive words too precipitately, Mr. Brock tried him first with a little compliment on the range of his reading, as shown by the volume of Sophocles and the volume of Goethe, which had been found in his bag, and asked how long he had been acquainted with German and Greek. The quick ear of Midwinter detected something wrong in the tone of Mr. Brock's voice. He turned in the darkening twilight, and looked suddenly and suspiciously in the rector's face. "'You have something to say to me,' he answered, "'and it is not what you are saying now.' There was no help for it but to accept the challenge. Very delicately, with many preparatory words, to which the other listened in unbroken silence, Mr. Brock came little by little nearer and nearer to the point. Long before he had really reached it, long before a man of no more than ordinary sensibility would have felt what was coming, 
Ozias Midwinter stood still in the lane and told the rector that he need say no more. "'I understand you, sir,' said the usher. "'Mr. Armadale has an ascertained position in the world. Mr. Armadale has nothing to conceal and nothing to be ashamed of. I agree with you that I am not a fit companion for him. The best return I can make for his kindness is to presume on it no longer. You may depend on my leaving this place to-morrow morning. He spoke no word more, he would hear no word more. With a self-control which, at his years and with his temperament, was nothing less than marvelous, he civilly took off his hat, bowed, and returned to the inn by himself. Mr. Brock slept badly that night. The issue of the interview in the lane had made the problem of Ozias Midwinter a harder problem to solve than ever. Early the next morning, a letter was brought to the rector from the inn, and the messenger announced that the strange gentleman had taken his departure. The letter enclosed an open note addressed to Allan, and requested Allan's tutor, after first reading it himself, to forward it or not at his own sole discretion. The note was a startlingly short one. It began and ended in a dozen words. Don't blame Mr. Brock. Mr. Brock is right. Thank you, and good-bye, O. M. The rector forwarded the note to its proper destination, as a matter of course, and sent a few lines to Mrs. Armadale at the same time to quiet her anxiety by the news of the usher's departure. This done, he waited the visit from his pupil, which would probably follow the delivery of the note in no very tranquil frame of mind. There might or might not be some deep motive at the bottom of Midwinter's conduct, but thus far it was impossible to deny that he had behaved in such a manner as to rebuke the rector's distrust and to justify Allan's good opinion of him. The morning wore on, and young Armadale never appeared. After looking for him vainly in the yard where the yacht was building, Mrs. Brock went to Mrs. Armadale's house, and there heard news from the servant which turned his steps in the direction of the inn. The landlord at once acknowledged the truth. Young Mr. Armadale had come there with an open letter in his hand, and had insisted on being informed of the road which his friend had taken. For the first time in the landlord's experience of him, the young gentleman was out of temper, and the girl who waited on the customers had stupidly mentioned a circumstance which had added fuel to the fire. She had acknowledged having heard Mr. Midwinter lock himself into his room overnight, and burst into a violent fit of crying. That trifling particular had set Mr. Armadale's face all of a flame. He had shouted and sworn, he had rushed into the staples and forced the hostler to saddle him a horse, and had set off full gallop on the road that Ozias Midwinter had taken before him. After cautioning the landlord to keep Allan's conduct a secret, if any of Mrs. Armadale's servants came that morning to the inn, Mr. Brock went home again and waited anxiously to see what the day would bring forth. To his infinite relief, his pupil appeared at the rectory late in the afternoon. Allan looked and spoke with a dogged determination, which was quite new in his old friend's experience of him. Without waiting to be questioned, he told his story in the usual straightforward way. He had overtaken Midwinter on the road, and, after trying vainly first to induce him to return, then to find out where he was going to, had threatened to keep company with him for the rest of the day, and had so extorted the confession that he was going to try his luck in London. Having gained this point, Allan had asked next for his friend's address in London, had been entreated by the other not to press his request, had pressed it nevertheless with all his might, and had got the address at last by making an appeal to Midwinter's gratitude, for which, feeling heartily ashamed of himself, he had afterward asked Midwinter's pardon. I like the poor fellow, and I won't give him up, concluded Allan, bringing his clenched fist down with a thump on the rectory table. Don't be afraid of my vexing my mother. I'll leave you to speak to her, Mr. Brock, at your own time and in your own way, and I'll just say this much more by way of bringing the thing to an end. Here is the address, safe in my pocketbook, and here am I, standing firm for once on a resolution of my own. I'll give you and my mother time to reconsider this, and when the time is up, if my friend Midwinter doesn't come to me, I'll go to my friend Midwinter. So the matter rested for the present, and such was the result of turning the castaway usher adrift in the world again.
A month passed and brought in the new year, 51. Overleaping that short lapse of time, Mr. Brock paused with a heavy heart at the next event. To his mind, the one mournful, the one memorable event of the series, Mrs. Armadale's death. The first warning of the affliction that was near at hand had followed close on the usher's departure in December, and had arisen out of a circumstance which dwelt painfully on the rector's memory from that time forth. But three days after Midwinter had left for London, Mr. Brock was accosted in the village by a neatly dressed woman wearing a gown and bonnet of black silk and a red paisley shawl, who was a total stranger to him, and who inquired the way to Mrs. Armadale's house. She put the question without raising the thick black veil that hung over her face. Mr. Brock, in giving her the necessary directions, observed that she was a remarkably elegant and graceful woman, and looked after her as she bowed and left him, wondering who Mrs. Armadale's visitor could possibly be. A quarter of an hour later the lady, still veiled as before, passed Mr. Brock again close to the inn. She entered the house and spoke to the landlady. Seeing the landlord shortly afterwards hurrying round to the stables, Mr. Brock asked him if the lady was going away. Yes, she had come from the railway on the omnibus, but she was going back again more creditably in a carriage of her own hiring, supplied by the inn. The rector proceeded on his walk, rather surprised to find his thoughts running inquisitively on a woman who was a stranger to him. When he got home again, he found the village surgeon waiting his return with an urgent message from Alan's mother. About an hour since, the surgeon had been sent for in great haste to see Mrs. Armadale. He had found her suffering from an alarming nervous attack, brought on, as the servants suspected, by an unexpected and possibly an unwelcome visitor who had called that morning. The surgeon had done all that was needful, and had no apprehension of any dangerous results. Finding his patient eagerly desirous, on recovering herself, to see Mr. Brock immediately, he had thought it important to humor her, and had readily undertaken to call at the rectory with a message to that effect. Looking at Mrs. Armadale with a far deeper interest in her than the surgeon's interest, Mr. Brock saw enough in her face, when it turned toward him on his entering the room, to justify instant and serious alarm. She allowed no opportunity of soothing her. She heeded none of his inquiries. Answers to certain questions of her own were what she wanted, and what she was determined to have. Had Mr. Brock seen the woman who had presumed to visit her at that morning? Yes. Had Alan seen her? No. Alan had been at work since breakfast, and was at work still, in his yard by the waterside. This latter reply appeared to quiet Mrs. Armadale for the moment. She put her next question, the most extraordinary question of the three, more composedly. Did the rector think Alan would object to leaving his vessel for the present, and to accompanying his mother on a journey to look out for a new house in some other part of England? In the greatest amazement, Mr. Brock asked what reason there could possibly be for leaving her present residence. Mrs. Armadale's reason, when she gave it, only added to his surprise. The woman's first visit might be followed by a second, and rather than see her again, rather than run the risk of Alan's seeing her and speaking to her, Mrs. Armadale would leave England if necessary, and end her days in a foreign land. Taking counsel of his experience as a magistrate, Mr. Brock inquired if the woman had come to ask for money. Yes. Respectably as she was dressed, she had described herself as being in distress. She had asked for money and had got it. But the money was of no importance. The one thing needful was to get away before the woman came again. More and more surprised, Mr. Brock ventured on another question. Was it long since Mrs. Armadale and her visitor had last met? Yes, longer than all Alan's lifetime, as long ago as the year before Alan was born. At that reply, the rector shifted his ground, and took counsel next of his experience as a friend. Is this person, he asked, connected in any way with the painful remembrances of your early life? Yes, with the painful remembrance of the time when I was married, said Mrs. Armadale. She was associated, as a mere child, with a circumstance which I must think of with shame and sorrow to my dying day. Mr. Brock noticed the altered tone in which his old friend spoke. 
and the unwillingness with which she gave her answer. "'Can you tell me more about her without referring to yourself?' he went on. "'I am sure I can protect you if you will only help me a little. Her name, for instance. You can tell me her name?' Mrs. Armadale shook her head. "'The name I knew her by,' she said, "'would be of no use to you. She has been married since then. She told me so herself. And without telling you her married name, she refused to tell it. Do you know anything of her friends? Only of her friends when she was a child. They called themselves her uncle and aunt. They were low people, and they deserted her at the school on my father's estate. We never heard any more of them. Did she remain under your father's care? She remained under my care. That is to say, she traveled with us. We were leaving England just at that time for Madeira. I had my father's leave to take her with me, and to train the wretch to be my maid. At those words, Mrs. Armadale stopped confusedly. Mr. Brock tried gently to lead her on. It was useless. She started up in violent agitation, and walked excitedly backward and forward in the room. "'Don't ask me any more!' she cried out, in loud, angry tones. I parted with her when she was a girl of twelve years old. I never saw her again. I never heard of her again. From that time to this, I don't know how she has discovered me after all the years that have passed. I only know that she has discovered me. She will find her way to Alan next. She will poison my son's mind against me. Help me to get away from her. Help me to take Alan away before she comes back. The rector asked no more questions. It would have been cruel to press her further. The first necessity was to compose her by promising compliance with all that she desired. The second was to induce her to see another medical man. Mr. Brock contrived to reach his end harmlessly in this latter case by reminding her that she wanted strength to travel, and that her own medical attendant might restore her all the more speedily to herself if he were assisted by the best professional advice. Having overcome her habitual reluctance to see strangers by this means, the rector at once went to Allan, and, delicately concealing what Mrs. Armadale had said at the interview, broke the news to him that his mother was seriously ill. Allan would hear of no messengers being sent for assistance. He drove off on the spot to the railway, and telegraphed himself to Bristol for medical help. On the next morning the help came, and Mr. Brock's worst fears were confirmed. The village surgeon had fatally misunderstood the case from the first, and the time was past now at which his errors of treatment might have been set right. The shock of the previous morning had completed the mischief. Mrs. Armadale's days were numbered. The son who dearly loved her, the old friend to whom her life was precious, hoped vainly to the last. In a month from the physician's visit all hope was over, and Allan shed the first bitter tears of his life at his mother's grave. She had died more peacefully than Mr. Brock had dared to hope, leaving all her little fortune to her son, and committing him solemnly to the care of her one friend on earth. The rector had entreated her to let him write and try to reconcile her brothers with her before it was too late. She had only answered sadly that it was too late already. But one reference escaped her in the last illness to those early sorrows which had weighed heavily on all her afterlife, and which had passed thrice already like shadows of evil between the rector and herself. Even on her deathbed, she had shrunk from letting the light fall clearly on the story of her past. She had looked at Alan kneeling by the bedside, and had whispered to Mr. Brock, Never let this namesake come near him. Never let that woman find him out. No word more fell from her that touched on the misfortunes which had tried her in the past, or on the dangers which she dreaded in the future. The secret which she kept from her son and from her friend was a secret which she carried with her to the grave. When the last offices of affection and respect had been performed, Mr. Brock felt it his duty, as executor to the deceased lady, to write to her brothers, and to give them information of her death. Believing that he had to deal with two men who would probably misinterpret his motives, if he left Allan's position unexplained, he was careful to remind them that Mrs. Armadale's son was well provided for, and that the object of his letter was simply to communicate the news of their sister's decease. The two letters were dispatched toward the middle of January, 
and by return of post the answers were received. The first which the rector opened was written not by the elder brother, but by the elder brother's only son. The young man had succeeded to the estates in Norfolk on his father's death, some little time since. He wrote in a frank and friendly spirit, assuring Mr. Brock that, however strongly his father might have been prejudiced against Mrs. Armadale, the hostile feeling had never extended to her son. For himself, he had only to add that he would be sincerely happy to welcome his cousin to Thorpe Ambrose whenever his cousin came that way. The second letter was a far less agreeable reply to receive than the first. The younger brother was still alive, and still resolute neither to forget nor forgive. He informed Mr. Brock that his deceased sister's choice of a husband, and her conduct to her father at the time of the marriage, had made any relations of affection or esteem impossible on his side from that time forth. Holding the opinions he did, it would be equally painful to his nephew and himself if any personal intercourse took place between them. He had adverted, as generally as possible, to the nature of the differences which had kept him apart from his late sister, in order to satisfy Mr. Brock's mind that a personal acquaintance with young Mr. Armadale was, as a matter of delicacy, quite out of the question, and having done this, he would beg leave to close the correspondence. Mr. Brock wisely destroyed the second letter on the spot, and, after showing Allan his cousin's invitation, suggested that he should go to Thorpe Ambrose as soon as he felt fit to present himself to strangers. Allan listened to the advice patiently enough, but he declined to profit by it. "'I will shake hands with my cousin willingly if I ever meet him,' he said, but I will visit no family and be a guest in no house in which my mother has been badly treated. Mr. Brock remonstrated gently and tried to put matters in their proper light. Even at that time, even while he was still ignorant of events which were then impending, Allan's strangely isolated position in the world was a subject of serious anxiety to his old friend and tutor. The proposed visit to Thorpe Ambrose opened the very prospect of his making friends and connections suited to him in rank and age, which Mr. Brock most desired to see. But Allan was not to be persuaded, he was obstinate and unreasonable, and the rector had no alternative but to drop the subject. One on another the weeks passed monotonously, and Allan showed but little of the elasticity of his age and character in bearing the affliction that had made him motherless. He finished and launched his yacht, but his own journeyman remarked that the work seemed to have lost its interest for him. It was not natural to the young man to brood over his solitude and his grief as he was brooding now. As the spring advanced, Mr. Brock began to feel uneasy about the future, if Allan was not roused at once by change of scene. After much pondering, the rector decided on trying a trip to Paris, and on extending the journey southward if his companion shown an interest in continental traveling. Allan's reception of the proposal made atonement for his obstinacy in refusing to cultivate his cousin's acquaintance. He was willing to go with Mr. Brock wherever Mr. Brock pleased. The rector took him at his word, and in the middle of March the two strangely assorted companions left for London on their way to Paris. End of Chapter 1 Part 2 Recording by Alan Winteroud Boomcoach.blogspot.com